Good. Okay, so um, I am going to uh, um, talk a little bit here about some of the trends. So let me introduce myself first. Uh, I lead home broadband products as well as the gaming products for Verizon Wireless, or Verizon, I should say. And Mike Talbert. Good, good morning. Uh, I lead premise architecture. As we look at convergence moving forward, you know, we, we really need to focus on how we evolve the premise. So, so we're going to give you a little perspective on what we see are some key trends as it relates to the residential gateway. By the way, both for 5G and our fixed wireless, but also for our, our fiber businesses and, and other broadband businesses. What I'm going to say today, there will be a little bit about 5G specifically, but it's not um, only for 5G. I think, okay. So I don't think uh, I'm going to have to, to um, surprise anybody that broadband has become as important to people's lives as water and power for most consumers. Um, and so over the past five years, though, we have seen a difference. So five years ago, as, as broadband providers, we, we focused primarily on speed. It was about how do we drive better, faster speeds. It's how we competed in the market. And if you, if you looked at a customer from a utility function of what they care about, the first thing was always price, you know, making sure it fits their budget. The second thing was what's the, what's the best performance. And along the way, Wi-Fi got into the mix. And um, what's happened in the last few years is Wi-Fi performance and coverage have become even more important than speed in many cases. So you have to still have speed, but you've also got to get great Wi-Fi coverage. Because what's interesting is most consumers, if you ask them, could not tell you the difference between internet speed and Wi-Fi. They don't, to them, Wi-Fi is internet. They don't really understand. And what operators have moved into is we've become managed Wi-Fi providers in the home, for lack of a better term. I mean, that's really where we have gone as an industry. But then, if you go beyond getting great Wi-Fi, we've started to see an interesting phenomenon occur, which is, um, if you go down that utility function, the next set of things that consumers care about as it relates to the home network is different based upon the segment of usages that they operate under. So up here on the screen, you can see, if, you know, for people who are gamers, gamers care about things like lag, right? They don't say latency, they don't say jitter, they say lag in a game. They care about how fast that new patch that they're going to download can get down to their, their home. But if I compare that to, say, a retiree, a retiree probably cares less about things like that and cares more about, hey, how do I get advanced security such that I don't have people breaking into my computer and hacking my 401k account? They care about things like aging with independence, where they can look at services where they might be able to you know, detect if you've, been, if you've fallen in your home and things like this. So that becomes important. And then you've got people who are the new telecommuters, the work at homes. They care about things like, you know, how great is my voice and video conferencing and collaboration tools work? So if you look at each of these things, they're each slightly different variations of broadband to meet the needs of these different segments. So it creates a really interesting problem. And so the residential gateway has to evolve to support a more personalized broadband experience for individual users, right? And so um, if you look at each of these segments, one of the key things that as we go to these segments is supporting a platform for value-added services and network services and features becomes really important. And I think that's a key thing that's starting to change, and the industry is going to have to evolve for this change. So let's talk a little bit about 5G, because obviously this is the 5G uh, base workshop, so I, I uh, would not be uh, on track if I didn't talk a little about 5G. So first, let me say, as I said before, 5G adds some interesting new opportunities and challenges to the market, but it's still, it's not like the user even knows what, whether it's 5G or fiber that, uh, in most cases, where right? they don't really care. 5G is just a new way we can get there. But what's nice about it is, is you know, at Verizon, um, these are, are what we call the, the eight currencies of 5G. A few of them are very applicable to, to uh, fixed broadband. I mean, fundamentally, 5G gives us an ability to do kind of fiber-like capabilities to uh, homes where it doesn't make sense to try and get fiber to it, right? And there's a lot of places where that fits into the equation, but you get, throughput and latency that starts to get closer to fiber-like speeds that we see today. Um, 
the other thing that I think that a, a lot of folks miss is the other big advantage of fixed wireless and 5G is, is it brings some additional uh, advantages in self-install and portability and easier moves, right? Uh, you know, as broadband providers, when people churn because of move, you know, that's a big thing. We have to rewin that subscriber in a new place. So if they can take 5G with them as they move either on vacation or they move to another house, there's some advantages from broadband providers in what that gives us, okay? But these advantages don't come without challenges. Um, you know, obviously when you're dealing with a wireless medium, you have more things as it relates to service assurance. How do you ensure that you're getting the quality of experience? And we've got a whole new set of management things we have to deal with, right? In the fiber world, you know, you have your TR69 on the residential gateway. You've got your, your OMCI that you use to manage on the optical infrastructure. Well, now we've got OMA DM. We've got, you know, some new management things we have to deal with that are interesting, right? You know, how do you push a firmware update? Which management environment do you use? Do you use the OMA environment we use in the wireless or do you use the TR69 environment we've typically used in broadband? So there's some challenges that we have to work through, um, but I think the opportunities are, outweigh that. And because you, you know, 5G is, a, you know, can take you to places that you couldn't take your fiber, it allows you to, to get a benefit out of both sides of there. So I've, I've paid some attention to 5G. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop out of 5G mode here a second and talk about some other things that matter. So uh, like most operators in the world, um, we've had a march of routers and, and residential gateways that have gone on. This is not even all of them. What you see on here is, is starting with the first Fios router uh, we delivered in 2006 through the one that's currently shipping in mass. And there's actually three more in the middle that I didn't include because they were just slight variations of the ones you see up there. Um, but you can see, as all operators, we have marched down a, a series of residential gateways. But if you think about what really were the differences in each of these residential gateways, it was primarily faster speeds, better Wi-Fi. That's really what we had done through most of the history of the innovation. And in 2018, though, um, Verizon launched its first value-added feature, where we integrated the first third-party service as a value-added feature. And it's, we call it Verizon uh, Home Network Protection. Uh, actually, the product manager is sitting right there in the middle of the room over there, hiding back there. Um, and we learned some things. You know, when you start to integrate third party in the old monolithic stacks where we had to integrate it individually for every router that we had in our environment, because they were different software environments, different OEMs, it really was a pain to launch a value-added service. And so it taught us an important lesson, which is we really need to look at how do we take the router software platform to more standardization. And I think across the industry, we're seeing this across all of the operators that they're looking for, how do you see more standardization in the router platforms? Um, so I'd like to say that, that this is some great new idea that Verizon has, but I would be completely lying. This is not like we're some brilliant group of people. Um, in reality, the notion of standardized platforms driving innovation and scale has been around for a long time. And if you look at the different ecosystems, I'll call them compute ecosystems, you know, whether it's PCs, mobile phones, you know, cloud servers, you know, if you look, we've all gotten to a point where you've got two to three kind of standard platforms that exist. And when you get to this, you see a massive amount of innovation that takes place. You know, you look at the mobile phone, I mean, last... Uh, last uh, stat was like 2 million mobile applications have been developed. You know, um, last I looked in the Windows Store, there was like 800,000 applications in the Windows Store alone. And that doesn't even include all the ones that were, you know, custom developed by individual corporations to their own needs. And so if you look at that level of innovation and you think about, you know, when the mobile phone and the smartphone first came out, who would have thought of applications like Uber and said, oh, this is going to change the way that we get around town you have never thought about that in those days. But, you know, you look at cloud. I mean, think about all of the stuff that has been you know, developed and delivered in the cloud. You know, getting to standardization does help innovation drive because there's really not scale in the industry today, right? I mean, the chipset providers are out having to do almost full operating systems. You got the OEMs that are, you know, trying to figure out how to personalize a router for every single operator. And you've got these software providers who are trying to do value-added services and, and they don't have a consistent landing zone by which they don't have to do a lot of integration to bring this app in. So we've got to get to better industry scale in order to make this work. So, so how do we get there? Um, 
Many operators in the world have already moved to trying to standardize amongst their own routers. I think probably people in this room have been in that space. I know quite a few operators that have done this. Um, and that does obviously help in that they can get faster time to market on new services because they can integrate once to the, that one software stack. So it's faster, but it really doesn't drive that innovation spiral, right? Because you still have each software provider having to figure out how to integrate with their router software stack. So getting to real scale means that you have to do something that's more industry-wide. We've got to start driving more consistency as an industry. Um, and there's different ways we could do that. I mean, on, uh, a purist would say, let's just open source it all. all right? Let's just put it all into open source and make it free. Well, that's, that doesn't take into account that we want innovation to occur. If you make everything free, there will not be innovation. And so I think the line that we think we have to draw on all of this is, you know, if you look at a router stack, you know, depending on which stack it is, you're looking at 18 to 22 million lines of code. About 70% of that is for a lot of plumbing things like DHCP and NAT and port filtering. And there's no differentiation for operators on any of that code. That's the stuff that makes a lot of sense to just go to open source because nobody really is any different in that code. But then there's that other 30%-ish or so of stuff that is an area of a lot of innovation. So right now we're seeing a lot of innovation going on in device identification and being really good at saying, not is that just an iPhone, but that's an iPhone 10 running you know, iOS 10.4.3, right? Which is really helpful as operators to be able to know what's on that network as you try and manage it. You know, you look at things like uh, the self-optimizing networks and the song controllers or the mesh controllers. A ton of innovation and in, in work in AI and how we get much, much more intelligent on how we make decisions there. And so for those types of services, what we need to do is create kind of standardized APIs and use containers by which to allow those services to just load into the box. Because we want to encourage that, that innovation to keep going. And once that, those things become to the point where there really is no more differentiation, then maybe those things eventually go to open source as well and we're worked on the next set of innovation. But We've got to get to this notion of standard APIs as a minimum for this world. And, and this is not a new thing, right? You know, I'd love to say that, that you know, we're the first ones of thought of standards. It's not you know, new at all, right? Broadband Forum has been working on standards around remote manageability, around speed tests, all kinds of different functions for quite some time. You know, Wi-Fi Alliance has been driving standardization in Wi-Fi and easy mesh and how do we get you know, those sorts of things standardized in our environment. And then on top of that, you've got great open source programs like OpenWRT that build a lot of the plumbing and a lot of the basics of a router stack that we can use. And so, um, you know, then you've got the Purple Foundation, which we find very interesting at Verizon because they're bringing it together into something that's carrier grade. They're really what, I mean, if you look at Purple Foundation and what they have been working on, they're kind of, think of them as like a downstream project to OpenWRT that's making a carrier-grade implementation, but it's still a nonprofit foundation that's focused on where you can do open source that makes sense. Let's do an open source implementation. And so things like Purple Mesh are a great uh, example of taking Easy Mesh and doing an open source instantiation for the industry. But then where there's not, they're setting APIs around the low level and the hardware abstraction layer, APIs around the high level and how applications will be, be set there. So it brings it all together into an interesting world. Um, but driving that isn't enough. You know, for you to really understand the benefit of all of this, you've got to realize that this is just the beginning of that standardization. Once we get to the residential gateway that gets standardized, most of these applications are going to start to live as entities both within the cloud and, in some cases, on the residential gateway. And so, we also have to start to look at how these devices become part of what at Verizon we call the intelligent edge. I suspect other operators use that term as well. And so the question is, is just like within the mobile network with 5G, as we're starting to move to mobile edge compute and the mech stuff, does the home router also become part of the intelligent edge? Right? I mean, this is a device that's in the home. You know, if you think about the typical home, it's one of the few devices that's still always on. It's the closest thing there is to a server in most people's home because with notebook computers and the move from desktops to notebooks, most homes don't have a desktop computer that's always on anymore. So this is one device that a man, an operator can always manage, 
how do we start to enable this intelligent edge compute in the home? And this is going to require standards where we start looking with the, working with the cloud providers, just like we're doing in Mech and saying, how do we enable a developer who's working in the cloud? Because if we try to do these standards specific to any one operator, a developer who's at Amazon or Azure or, or name your cloud provider, if they had to know how to deploy it differently for every one of us operators, it would never occur. So we've got to get to standards so that developers can more quickly deploy applications into this intelligent edge. So, um, you know, we should look at this as kind of a, a key trend that we've got to go figure out. So, for those that don't know, um, we didn't really make a big news about it. We joined the Purple Foundation um, earlier this year as a Platinum member, as Verizon. Um, we've been working actively with a number of the operators, trying to get more and more operator involvement. Obviously, Vodafone was already one of the lead uh, operators in the Purple Foundation. So we've been trying to rally the industry around this vision that we've got to start to get the standardization to occur. We've got to get it for building scale in the industry. Um, and so this vision is, is very focused on how do we enable innovation while not wasting time on things that don't add value. It's a vision focused on making the intelligent edge. And it's a vision that we would like to get you know, as many parts of the ecosystem, the industry that's in this room involved in. Because the only way this works is if we all work together. So we welcome you guys to join us in this activity. We would love to see the industry get there. And with that, I think um, Mike and I are gonna take some questions here for a couple minutes. How are we doing in time? I still have three minutes and 34 seconds. Any questions? Nothing. Okay, we got one. Uh, hi, uh, Ray Lemaitre from Light Reading. So where are you in the development of some kind of uh, APIs that might become a, I guess, a de facto standard for the industry? Um, how many other operators are, are joining you already? So you mentioned Vodafone's there, you've joined. Who else are you bringing along to that party? So um, I'm trying to make sure I only, I, I don't want to like out any operator here today on who's all in. Um, the, uh, I believe the operators who are official members are uh, us, Vodafone, I think BT is on that, the, the slide already. Um, however, there is per active participation by about seven more that are actively involved, seven more majors out there and we keep on you know, every week we tr keep trying to drag some more into the, uh, the effort because we really want this to be a true open environment. The goal of this is for it not to be, you know, the Verizon and Vodafone purple forum. It should be a, a forum that's much more like the 3GPP um, where we have kind of everyone working together and we have rotating chairs and all of that kind of good stuff. So um, membership numbers, I, I, I don't know the total number of operators. There, there are logos on the website if you got to the purple foundation. Um, so your other question was, timeline. oh, timeline. So the high-level API, the first draft of the high-level API is being reviewed. So next week is the Purple Summit, which is a big get-together of the OpenWRT community and the Purple community. They will be reviewing the first draft of the high-level API. Um, I think the first drops of what's known as Purple WRT, which is the open source, it's open WRT with carrier grade open source features. So it's not an entire stack, but it's the stuff that, you know, is kind of all open sourced. Um, that is already available as a build today. Um, the low-level API, I don't know the exact timing on when they're going to release the first version. They already kind of know what they want to do in that space. It's focused on how do we use standard Linux services as the basis of the low-level API so we don't reinvent the wheel. Um, but the exact, uh, you know, there are some things that have to be enhanced for the packet processor, et cetera, that, that they're working on, on getting done. So, you know, I think you're, to answer your question of when is the first time we would have a build of Purple, what do you think, Mike? Probably... Uh, so, so we have builds today. We yeah, but what, a production grade waters. build. Probably another year? I, I would say we're probably a year out. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of work to do to get there. Yeah. Yeah, there's builds you can use to work on it today, but it, uh, a true production build, I think we're about a year out. Other questions? If not, I'm giving back 31 seconds. All right. Thank you. Thanks, guys.